business accounts for more than 95% of all Australian businesses and are responsible for the health and safety of approximately 4.8 million workers. For most small businesses, a workers' compensation claim may only occur once every several years. For many employers, they pay their premium annually and have no further contact or relationship with their insurer. One of the most challenging elements of workers' compensation schemes is the number of stakeholders involved and the various relationships that exist between these stakeholders. At the immediate level, you have the relationship between the employer and the worker. As the claim progresses, you then have the claims manager or claims agent, the insurer and the treating doctor involved. You may also have other allied health professionals, such as the rehab providers. And finally, the regulator may become involved, although not always. So managing this, these relationships is understandably challenging. In addition to this, our employer members also report difficulties with the lack of scheme experience, poor understanding of roles and responsibilities, limited training options for their staff in understanding these workers' compensation duties and responsibilities, an increase in stress claims, poor understanding of and support of claims management and return to work in general. The Australian Chamber is a member of Safe Work Australia and represents employers on both work health and safety and workers' compensation matters. Over the past year, Safe Work Australia has had an increased focus in workers' compensation with a number of active projects addressing common issues such as the role of the GP, best practice management of psychological claims, and a focus and look into return to work data and improvements there. The presentation today is a partnership between the Australian Chamber, Is Better Together program, Safe Work Australia and Smart Company, aimed at providing audience members and viewers with first-hand information from multiple stakeholders within the scheme, information on resources, and clarification of roles and responsibilities. Um, we're lucky and fortunate enough to have three different perspectives on, workers, on the workers' compensation process today. Um, our goal today is to guide small businesses on the workers' compensation journey and process. Um, so Liz, if we can start with you for the first question. Mm. What are the top three concerns that employers have when it comes to workers' compensation? Well, the Chamber recently conducted a survey and uh, there are quite a few common themes that came out. Uh, but the overarching principle was the need to understand the employer's business and how a claim affects the workplace. Uh, but in terms of the three top items, I guess uh, the importance of consultation and communication, that's very important. Uh, effective return to work outcomes is also very important, as is um, premiums not being too volatile and having enough notice in advance so they can uh, structure their cash flow accordingly. Um, I guess the underpinning uh, driver is the communication and consultation. That's, that's the most important thing. And um, basically talking to the employer. So what, what is the role of the injured worker when the injury occurred? Mm -hmm. What happened? What are suitable duties? Mm -hmm. And how do we get everyone back on track? Sure. And so what about small business in particular? Um, mm -hmm. Do they have the same concerns or do they differ considering that they're less resourced? Um, they have the same concerns, they just have additional concerns yeah. because they are less resourced. Um, and as Jen said that you know often they don't have much experience with claims it, it tends to be the larger employers that have more experience with claims and claims management so obviously once you've had one or two under your belt you're a bit more familiar with the process so um, I guess it's the awareness of what to do and when to do it how to do it um, who can I call on mm -hmm. and uh, from a resourcing aspect I think it's not just money, we tend to forget it's time poor, mm -hmm. as well as not having enough money to, to spend on things, adapting the workplace. And also, uh, especially with small business, 
they're under-resourced in terms of labour. So they can't just pick up the phone and hire someone else. You know, often you've got the remaining employees there. So if someone's off work, then it's basically everyone's shoulder to the wheel and, and try and cover all the bases and until that person gets back to work and, and things can go back to normal. Data shows that most small businesses have one claim every 15 years. So, as Liz said, they don't have the resources or it falls under the HR manager or uh, somebody else who, whose main um, job has nothing to do with safety or return to work or anything like that. So, scheme agents in the past and, and I care in the future will, will perhaps look at providing or have, have provided return to work courses um, and information around that to support uh, employers, especially small employers. But I guess to Liz's point earlier, communication is key. Um, whether it's eye care or email or joy moving forward, that contact with an employer to help that return to work process from day one is absolutely key to a successful outcome. Sure. If I can just pick up on the HR manager, many small businesses don't yeah. have a, an HR manager. So we do need to keep in mind that um, small businesses aren't big businesses shrunk. Small businesses start that, and they grow organically with one person or a couple of people. So you really need to, to keep in mind where small businesses come from. Uh, in terms of the communication, one, one positive thing that came out was the experience with insurance brokers. So we found those employers who had insurance brokers overall had a much better experience with, with claims management and return to work because they just found that person uh, was the go-between and that person understood their business well and understood the system well and it actually helped them navigate the system. So that extra layer of support. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So clearly insurance um, is an issue of concern and perhaps a bugbear for businesses um, and we all know that insurance can vary greatly. Um, so when it comes to workers' compensation, what's the insurer's role? Um, the insurer's role... In, support, in supporting employers. Yeah, I think the insurer's role begins um, as a protection mechanism, um, particularly for small employers. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's a statutory purchase. Not, not all the um, uh, purchases of uh, workers' compensation necessarily want to buy it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it, it's uh, as I say, a statutory purchase that all employers must um, buy virtually all employees have a few, few exceptions to that. Um, uh, but really what it's doing is it's providing that protection mechanism to the employers. And I think that's particularly relevant with small employers. Mm -hmm. um, if you have one significant incident within your workplace and you're a small employer, that could effectively um, you know, be, be the end of your business in, in terms of the financial consequences to that incident. So, so the provision of insurance in the first place is that um, protection. Um, that's before the event. Once the event occurs, then, um, uh, and again, relative to, to small employers, that's where the insurer's role really kicks in um, and actually providing support at the time that it's needed. So there's, the, there's that sort of um, hardline financial support. So by buying a policy, um, what the employer is effectively doing is it's um, what the insurer is effectively doing is saying, I will discharge your financial liabilities associated with the injury. So I will pay the benefits that are payable, such as the weekly benefits to the worker, mm -hmm. the medical expenses, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but the, the role is much broader than that. Um, and and the, the insurer can help um, in terms of um, uh, orchestrating the, the rehabilitation and the injury management for the worker following the um, injury. So that happens on a number of levels really. It happens quite on a high level from an organisational perspective. So all insurers should have a, an injury management program in place which just articulates um, their processes and procedures that they're going to adopt um, in order to support their, um, uh, their employers. Um, but more specifically on a case-by-case -case basis where there's a significant injury for a worker uh, and our definition of significant injury is where it involves an absence of seven days from work or more, mm -hmm. um, then um, there's a requirement for an injury management plan. And that is basically the, the insurer sitting down, talking to all of the stakeholders and saying, what do we need to do in order to get this worker back to health 
back to work. Sure. So they're talking to the, um, to the doctor, they're talking to the worker themselves, obviously, they're talking to the employer, and they're saying these are the, the things that we can put into place. So you've got a soft tissue injury, we can put some physiotherapy in place. If you've got a psychological injury, we can look at bringing a psychologist in to, uh, to provide some support. Uh, we can make those uh, payments of weekly payments to the worker so that the worker's not financially disadvantaged whilst they're going through this process. And we can actually get everybody's mind set on what it is we're here to do, which is actually achieve return to health, return to work. What should an employer expect from an insurer in terms of support? Uh, Liz touched on earlier, Spencer has as well. Um, for us, we, we need to understand our customers. Yeah. It's the first time in 30 years that, that we've actually had face-to-face -face communications with our customers. In the past, it's been through scheme agents. So there's always been a third party there. Um, and, and for us to sort of just come into the scheme and, and say that we know everybody would, would be remiss of us, um, we, we absolutely need to understand the inherent risks of businesses. Um, we need to have conversations with them, understand what it is that you do day in and day out. Uh, and then if you do have an injury, understand what you've got in place um, to, to help you navigate that injury and, and what support you need. Um, to promote recovery at work. Um, for us, <coughs> that's the first key thing. The other thing, and, and part of the reason why we made the changes we made, was to provide a system that's easy to navigate and easy to understand. Even if it's as simple as turning an eight-page renewal document into a four-page renewal, renewal document uh, with a couple of nice graphics on there that show you how you're performing, what your premium's doing, what your wages have done. Um, we will move towards early next year, a portal where small employers can go in and pretty much manage their workers' compensation um, without talking to us if they don't want to. Um, I think Spencer and Liz both touched on the fact that for a lot of small employers, you pay your workers' insurance because you have to, it's a statutory class, but then you don't need to talk to us for another 12 months until you pay it again. Mm -hmm. So um, for us, it was understanding that customers wanted to have a simple online process if they can. and. The key thing for me uh, around those 4,700 new businesses we've put in place is about 80% of that has been done online. So again, we listen to our customers and, an, and another good thing for me is about 15 to 20% of that um, was actually done on weekends or outside of business hours. So again, small employers, they've got enough on their plate just managing their business without having to deal with insurance or anything like that. So we're listening to our customers. We're not there yet. Nowhere near where we want to be as far as um, providing an insurance product that, that meets the needs of our customers. Um, we'll continue to, to reach out to peak bodies like the business chamber, um, associations, industries, and have those conversations just so that we can get a better understanding of what's happening and what impacts on you, whether you're a small employer or a medium or a large employer, and what we can do to support you. I think, so, sorry, I, I think I'd just support that and, and um, elaborate a little bit on what Peter was saying about um, the um, explaining to employers what it's all about. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's true from, a, from an underwriting perspective. You know, what, what am I actually buying? Mm -hmm. um, because not all employers know what they're actually buying. Um, and also post-incident, um, the, the workers' compensation legislation is really quite complex. Um, so understanding what a worker is entitled to um, from either a worker's or an employer's perspective is a pretty tricky thing. Um, you know, I've been knocking around for a few years, and I'm still struggling with it myself sometimes. <laughs> um, so, so I think that we probably have a, we have a joint responsibility um, as, as the insurer and as the regulator to actually try and unpack that as much as we can. Um, I know you've been doing work on your web website, we've been doing work on ours as well to actually try and cut through some of that complication of the legislation and actually um, unpack for workers and for, for employers what it's all about and what, it, um, what they're buying and what entitlements that brings at the end of the day. So it's important to the, the clarification process is important. I think clarification is very important. Um, it's, as well as being a statutory scheme, it's compulsory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's not, getting around it? let's not skirt around it. <laughs> yeah. It's compulsory. Yeah. Um, it is com convoluted, the legislation, the two pieces of legislation. And um, what I would like to see as well is not only assistance post-claim, but understanding who is covered and when they need to take out cover. Because a worker is not just an employee who's on wages. A worker includes particular types of contractors, <laughs> subcontractors, and also working directors. So you can have a director who's taken out key man insurance 
and yet, strictly speaking, should should be or should be looking at whether or not they should have workers' comp instead of that, so they think they're covered. So um, I think education is quite key and uh, I personally would like to see a little bit more than just masses of information stuck on a website. I think it, it needs to be more helping employers along the way and understanding what they have to do and when they have to do it. Can the panel tell us a little bit about how occupational rehabilitation fits in with the scheme and whether or not rehabilitation providers are being utilised as much as they could be when it comes to supporting the worker or employer? Um, I, I think in general terms the, the use of um, rehabilitation providers is on the increase within the New South Wales mm -hmm. scheme at the moment. Certainly the, um, the uh, statistical data supports that conclusion. Um, I think that they're, um, uh, they're potentially a very useful um, resource within, uh, within a case. Um, so an insurer and an employer, an insurer will engage uh, a rehab provider essentially on behalf of the employer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really, it's their job to come in and bring the stakeholders together and talk about, well, what does, what does work look like? What does a return to work look like? How do we take what the GP is telling us in terms of what this worker has capacity to do and translate that into um, uh, some meaningful work for that individual in their, with their employer, ideally, or with an alternative employer if that's not possible. Sure. Um, and what, what are the things that are stopping that from happening and how can we circumnavigate those issues? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, quite a, it's probably more of an art than a science, I think. <laughs> um, uh, and and it's, a really, it's just about cutting through um, and getting back to the basics that we keep talking about, which is keep talking, keep the communication going. And so generally, how do employers engage with the rehabil rehabilitation provider? Is that the role of the employer or is, there, is that the role of the insurer? Uh, as Spencer said, it's generally the insurer that will, will instigate that contact. And it can be a number of reasons. It can be um, the, the worker is struggling to get, to get back to work, the communication's broken down between the employer and the um, the, the employee, the worker, the treating doctors probably not where we want them to be in regards to the return to work process. So mm -hmm. generally it's the insurer, but there's other stakeholders in, in the relationship that, can, that, that have relationships with rehab providers that might recommend it, so whether it's the insurance broker. Some employers retain rehab providers to do the return to work process for them. Sure. So um, it provides that level of support that they don't have um, at, uh, you know, at a cost, but that th th provides the, the detail around suitable duties or how they might manage a particular situation for um, that particular claim or, or injured worker. So it, it, primarily it's the insurer, but certainly there's no reason why an employer can't, can't open dialogue with a rehab provider and or their insurance broker if they use a broker. So Liz, um, what sort of support do you think employers would like to receive a part of, as part of this process um, from insurance through to re rehabilitation and then eventually and hopefully the outcome of returning back to work? Well, I think it depends on the profile of the employer. So if the employer hasn't had any claims or many claims, then I think it's more of an awareness education uh, piece and it's, it's what do I do, how do I do it, when do I have to do it by, who do I talk do I to? to? So it's it's really basic stuff. Yeah. Um, very simple, straightforward. If they understand the process from go to woe and what's required of them and, and when they need to do it and how to do it, that is the very minimal level of support. Um, then I guess the next level is once you've got the claim, you've got the administrative side of things mm -hmm. and managing the claim. So employers, what what is the effect that this claim has on the employer's workplace? So you're one person down. Who's going to cover that? You don't just ring up a, a labour hire agency and, and pull them in. They might not be able to afford that. Yeah. So, you know, what's the effect of that claim on that workplace? Um, as well as the physical sort of labour and as I touched on before, getting those who are able-bodied to, to cover off on that type of work, you've also got the morale. 
you know, there's a fair bit of a morale aspect involved from from the employer's perspective and keeping the whole team happy and things going along quite well. Especially in a small business. Especially, where... yes, definitely. And and the admin side of things, you know, I've, I've heard that even though um, with the, the weekly, the calculation of the weekly payments is an absolute nightmare, um, first the calculation of it and then secondly having it fit into their own payroll system. Mm -hmm. uh, it often means that employers have to create their own manual system for their workers on workers comp and have that totally outside their normal payroll system. And then there are some employers who have told me that it's just too hard to sort out for now. So they just keep paying the normal amount of wage and then they work it out later and then ask for, for a refund. But not all employers can do that. Not mm. all employers have the cash flow to do yeah. that. Yeah. So it's it's very much the practical hands-on. How do the employers actually figure out what to do in amongst their normal business activities? Mm. I think there are also um, other supports that are available and uh, at risk of preempting a future question <laughs> um, uh, that um, that address some of the, the, the issues that you raise. Um, so, for example, um, uh, we have vocational rehab uh, programs, um, which um, CIRA provides and, uh, and insurers can access. Um, and, and they cover a range of different scenarios. Um, and probably the, the most pertinent one to this audience is our um, return to work assist for micro employers. Um, so, so this is talking about when um, an employer has five or fewer um, uh, employees and you have an injury and the employer is absent from work, if they have some capacity to come back into work but not capacity to fulfil their pre-injury duties, then what MicroAssist does is it says, well, the insurer can continue to pay the weekly benefits, the wages for that person, whilst they come back into the um, working environment, which means that the, the small employer is not disadvantaged mm -hmm. so that they can actually um, go to an external contractor and get somebody else in to to um, to fulfil the substantive part of that role. So it's, it's almost allowing the worker to come back on a supernumerary um, uh, uh, basis, mm -hmm. which is good for the worker, you know, getting, getting out of the house, getting back into the working environment is fundamentally good for you. Um, and it builds their capacity and it builds their capability whilst at the same time not disadvantaging the um, uh, the, the employer. Um, there, there are other things that, um, that the vocation rehab programs can do as well, such as work trials. So where a, uh, a worker has some capacity but there's no suitable duties um, within their employer, then they can go to a host employer. Um, uh, and that host employer, um, d again, doesn't pay their wages but helps to build their capacity and their capability whilst they're um, recovering and then they can return to their pre-injury um, employer. Um, we have a job cover placement programme um, which um, financially incentivises um, employers to take on a, a, a worker with a previous injury. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a financial um, incentive there for the employer to, um, uh, to take that on. Um, and then there are a range of um, a sort of more bespoke um, solutions such as retraining for the um, for the worker to, to enable them to, to pick up new skills, um, workplace modifications, um, so things like you know we've we've paid in the past for um, modifications to a uh, I was going to say pickup truck, that's English, um, to, a, to a utility truck um, and put a sort of a, a, a crane type device on the back so that it would enable the, the worker to, to fulfil their, um, uh, their role. Um, and if you get creative and you can use some of these things, and again, this is, this is really where the insurer can add some value for, for the employer and say, these things are available, let's talk to you about them. Um, and my advice to employers would be always to, to come back to the insurer and say, what else can you do? Yeah. What else can you do? What else can you do? And actually promote those conversations as well. Because there are resources. Inside. There are resources available, yeah. yeah. I think probably small businesses' perspective on workers' uh, compensation is that it, it, it is a one-size-fits-all and I think what we've got out of this conversation today that it, is, it can be a collaborative process and there are supports in, uh, in place um, and, uh, and readily accessible and there's a lot of um, information there uh, to support um, very specific cases as well as quite generic ones as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the other yeah. thing that employers can do is um, obviously they can 
visit our websites, um, uh, or they can call um, 13 10 50 for, which is our um, uh, call centre line, um, and there's information available so you can actually speak to a real person and say, um, I've got a question about whether I need to buy insurance or I've got a problem with my claim or whatever the case may be. So there, there is always a, a resource there as well.